Our next speaker is Patty Wood, who's founder and director of Grassroots Environmental Education, an organization dedicated to educating the public about the relationship between environmental exposures and human health yes. risks. A visiting scholar at Adelphi University, Ms. Wood lectures on community and environmental health in the School of Nursing. She works with the New York State Department of Health on environmental issues and is the author of the Child Safe Guidelines and the Child Safe School and co-producer of the documentary film, Our Children at Risk, a uh, very good documentary, which educates the public and decision makers about the unique vulnerability of children and environmental toxins. And I must say, she's been helping out, and in grassroots environmental education has been helping out in Connecticut also with the passage of the law and pesticide ban and helping keeping it in place. Right side, wait, hold on. The right side. That's gonna forward you, but let me get you up here first. While Chip is working on this for me, I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, and it's really nice to meet some of the people that I've had lots of phone and email conversations with over the years. Um, especially Rabina right there, who I've spoken to se several times, um, a board member of, of uh, Beyond Pesticides. Um, this is an opportunity for me to just quickly um, tell you the, um, you know, how we got started and the story of grassroots and why we're so involved in this issue. Um, my activism in environmental issues began when my kids were in elementary school and I was the nutrition chairman. And as part of that, an extension of that job, I started an organic garden at the school. And one afternoon, I was weeding, which we all do in our gardens, uh, and there was a school district employee approaching the garden um, with a backpack sprayer and a nozzle. And I said, where are you going and what are you doing? He says, I'm just gonna spray all the weeds around here, around the perimeter and in the, in the pathways. And I said, why would you be doing this on a school property, especially in an organic vegetable garden? I mean, the children eat these vegetables. And so I um, diverted him um, away from the garden and I went to the school district, the superintendent, and I said, why are we putting poisons on our school property? And there was a lot of discussion and I gave him a lot of information and we had a board meeting and the board actually passed the first um, policy in New York State to ban pesticides, and that was in Port Washington, New York, back in 1991. Um, so uh, that is how we started, on, and then also in the early 1990s, as a member of the Town of North Hempstead Ecological Commission, I was actually asked to review their IPM policy and update it, and I said that I couldn't do that, that um, there was actually no reason to be using pesticides, which an IPM policy often um, employees, uh, and uh, this is mainly for parks and lawns uh, and children's playing fields and so on. And so I actually wrote an OPM policy, an organic pest management policy for the town of North Hempstead. I believe there was one other policy in place at that time in California. Um, and we worked with landscapers and experts like Paul Sachs and Elaine Ingham, uh, who came in and actually trained our town employees in the, uh, in the cultural practices of organic pest management. Um, so slowly other towns on Long Island and especially in Westchester County where we had a very, um, a very, uh, what should I say, um, open uh, government um, began to experiment with organic turf management. Um, one of my good friends and colleagues who I worked with, Pat Beckett, um, she actually left Port Washington, moved to Marblehead, Massachusetts um, and brought an OPM policy to that community. Um, and it was interesting because it wasn't the town government, it was actually Department of Health that actually passed that policy in Marblehead. But it was also very serendipitous because I met Chip Osborne um, through that connection. And we have been working together ever since. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just briefly go through this uh, because I know that we're way behind schedule here. Um, it's actually much easier to work your way up than to start at the top. Um, working on the local level in villages, towns, and school districts is the way that we have um, been successful. Um, politicians and decision makers rarely want to be the first to try something. Um, so unless you have friends in high places, my recommendation is to start local, even if it's just in your neighborhood or even on your street, um, to build and then build on that success. 
Um, we use the scissor strategy. Um, we simultaneously uh, educate consumers or parents um, and the industry professionals um, so that we're creating a supply and demand situation here. This has worked so well um, in Westchester County where we have done multiple trainings with Chip um, and an arborist who is um, you know, of the same mind. Um, is uh, you know is the is the county in the United in the United States that has the most number of organic landscapers, and we also have a lot of consumers uh, in that county who want organics because they understand uh, the relationship between their children's health and exposure to these poisons. Framing the issue, um, we've said this many times already uh, at this conference, but nothing is more important than how you frame it. Um, this is an issue of children's health. It is not a pesticide restriction issue. It's not about regulating agricultural use, curtailing your freedom, or telling people what to do. This is just about one thing, and that's children's health. Um, and actually, you know, it's about all of our health. But if we focus on children, we can really, we can really move the ball and move it more quickly. Um, and so we've heard about why children are uniquely vulnerable. Um, we say that they are disproportionately exposed and affected. Um, but our target demographic um, has been and, and will be um, that uh, we are going to be uh, talking to parents of young children. Now, when I talk to parents of, um, of children in either PTA meetings or you know, neighborhood association meetings, I can't talk about 2,4-D as a phenoxy herbicide and a chemical that may be contaminated with dioxin, but I talk about it as one ingredient in Agent Orange, which they all understand. And they also understand and have heard about um, Vietnam vets who are suing the federal government for their cancers and their children's birth defects. So that really hits home to them. They don't really want to put that same chemical in their backyard where their children play. And they're very surprised to hear that it is, a, it is typically a component of the weed and feed product. And if I get to them before that first spring application, which was hard to do this year because spring just came so fast, um, that um, you know, I, I talk to them you know, about you know, that first application, that weed and feed product, and how you're just setting that whole thing in motion with these chemical applications, one after another after another. Um, OK, so what we do at Grassroots is to bridge that gap between the scientific community, um, which you know, is, is really quite stunning. And we have um, heard from a lot of these experts here today and the public. And the public is afraid of science. They don't understand it, but they do understand that they want to protect their children. Um, so we do a lot, of, um, a lot of promotion in the schools in the spring also with a spring alert flyer that goes to every school district on Long Island and in Westchester County just warning um, parents of children K through 3 about um, what these little yellow flags mean and that the children and their pets should never play on those lawns. Okay, let's see. Um, building the foundation, the opponents of natural lawn care, um, or natural turf management have been told by the chemical companies, as Chip said, that organics don't work and they're too expensive. And you need to convince them otherwise. Um, what we have done is we have reached out to all the organic landscapers in an area. We've introduced them um, and, we've, uh, and or th we've introduced us to them. Um, we tell them what we're doing. We seek their advice, make them part of, their t of our team. Um, and we always have sponsored trainings. This is critical, critical, critical. Um, we build a list of all the landscapers and turf managers in the area. We set a date. We hire Chip and, uh, and sometimes our arborist, James Sotillo, um, to come in and make a presentation. Um, and to get people interested um, in this, the industry interested, we have, uh, we've made a, a small little video uh, introductory DVD called Growing Your Business the Natural Way. Um, it's about adding a, an organic component to your existing business, but many people actually, once they've been trained, by, especially by CHIP, will actually convert their business to organics. Um, legislation. Um, follow the models. For villages, towns, and cities, a model OPM policy is available. It's on our website, um, grassrootsinfo.org. Um, if, you, if you write your own policies or allow lawmakers or lawyers to write them, you can get tripped up in some of the issues that have plagued communities where those efforts have failed. 
Um, make sure that you can provide model language to anyone considering legislation. Um, in, we have a program called the Child Safe School where we look at three exposures that are common to all schools, um, not only pesticides, which is one of them, but also um, toxic cleaning products and um, the idling of diesel vehicles, which John Wargo spoke about earlier today. Um, and we have um, in each one of these um, components of the Child Safe School program, uh, we have a sample policy uh, which can actually be used as a, you know, a model um, or a draft and can be, um, it can be adjusted for any uh, school. Um, for states, um, we want to follow the model set by New York State and that's pretty exciting. Um, New York State prohibits the use of pesticides on all school grounds, kindergarten through 12th grade, public, private, and parochial, including daycare centers. Um, the law was passed uh, under Governor Patterson uh, in June of 2010. It went into effect just one year later. Um, and so it has been in effect for almost one year. Um, this did not happen easily. Uh, I remember the two days before that law was signed by Governor Patterson, it happened to be a Sunday afternoon, and we were called by the governor's office, and uh, they said that the industry was there and was questioning um, some of the things that we had, had um, in our, um, our turf comparison report, which is actually written by Chip Osborne and, and Doug Wood, who's my husband. And, and first, my first question was, what is the industry doing in the governor's office on a Sunday afternoon? That was my first question. But um, anyway, so we went through this back and forth for about three hours, line by line, answering every single one of their objections. And Governor Patterson signed it on Tuesday morning into law. So that happened, and that's really, really exciting. So then we had our work cut out for us. Then between June of 2010 and 2011, we trained in seven, or no, I think it was nine, nine different regions of New York State from Montauk to Buffalo. And we invited every single school district to come in and get trained to understand. And Chip, you know, it's amazing, Chip, that, um, that you had time to do this, but nevertheless, he was there flying back and forth all over, all over the state when it was really cold and snowy. Okay, um, so you might see that there's an absence of, uh, of IPM uh, language uh, here in, in, in the New York State legislation. We were very, very clear about that. Um, we just said uh, we will not tolerate any IPM language here because we're just talking about turf pesticides. Um, as Chip had mentioned, um, structural use of pesticides um, has some place. Uh, there are public health issues involved sometimes where you have rodent issues and so on. And children are not actually climbing under you know, refrigerators and sinks and so on in the, in the kitchens of schools, but children are in direct, intimate contact with those turf fields and with their playgrounds. And so that's really where most of the exposure at schools takes place, and so that was the, fo that was the focus. And we really had to fight with them to convince them that there really were no public health issues involved with dandelions and grubs. Um, but um, we did allow them to put um, those exemptions in if the, someone deemed that there was a public health threat like children could trip on a weed or on a, on a, a, um, you know, a, a space that was, um, you know, that had been dug out and that the grass had come out of, like a little divot, um, that, um, that they, could actually, they could actually call that a public health threat and that they would then get um, a waiver to come in and remedy that using completely non-toxic methods, but they could get, come in and use that um, and, and take care of that. Um, we, I think the most, the most uh, important and strongest argument here for just making it turf pesticides, just outdoor use of pesticides, was that these pesticides can, not only are children intimately exposed and you know, they, they are exposed through three different routes, through inhalation, skin absorption, um, and accidental ingestion, but they also track these turf pesticides indoors, back into their classrooms, into their lockers, on the bottoms of their shoes when they throw their shoes in there, on carpets. A lot of school classrooms today have like a story hour where the kids lie down or a resting place. And these pesticides typically are, are designed to break down um, through uh, photo degradation, uh, through um, rainfall and uh, um, soil microbial activity, and that never happens inside. In fact, this was one way that we got 
uh, the Nassau County Health Commissioner to agree not to spray for West Nile virus um, when, you know, when it first hit the New York City area was the fact that these pesticides could be tracked indoors. Also the fact that sumithrin, which was the active ingredient in Anvil, which is the product that they were going to spray, um, was an estrogen mimic. And we had scientists at Mount Sinai School of Medicine at that time who were doing breast cancer research. And they, we got them to talk directly to um, the health commissioner. And she was, she was convinced. Um, so another strategy, and that is getting someone on their same, a colleague, to actually speak to another colleague who's in a position of power um, or decision maker um, to perhaps you know, bring it um, more closely to their attention. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go really fast because Jerry, I'm actually looking at, he says stop on his sign. I, all right, so legislators, I'm gonna go right on Jerry, you know what? She ignored you too, okay? <laughs> um, this, is, um, this is really uh, one other really important piece of this is that after we got Port Washington to adopt a board policy to ban pesticides and we had a lot of parents involved in this and they were not using pesticides on their own properties either, we also got um, at the time of this, uh, this legislation, we got school superintendents, facilities directors, and parents to actually call the governor's office and to write letters and say, we're already doing it, and we're doing it successfully, and we're doing it cost effectively, and it's working. And some of them have at, had actually been doing it for seven or eight years at that point. So it was very convincing that we had already, you know, more than, you know, probably uh, two dozen school districts in New York State who had adopted our child safe school policy to actually weigh in and say, we're doing it. We've set a precedent here. So, you know, all of these arguments that the industry have really don't hold any water. And you could see that from Chip's, um, Chip's pictures. Um, all right, resist industry to insert IPM because as we know, IPM is business as usual, which is why the industry here in Connecticut wants to roll back the ban and make it an IPM bill again. It's all about market share. Okay, so, and every picture here um, is really a picture of, this is the East Meadow School District down on Long Island, which is 100% organic. Um, we, are, we are an organization that was, um, that was um, incorporated in 2000 as a nonprofit organization, and uh, we are supposed to empower individuals to act as catalysts for change in their own communities, and we are available to any one of you with a lot of materials um, to support you in your efforts. So um, I just wanna wrap it up quickly with a school garden thing coming full circle here. On Monday morning, I will be at three schools and we will be actually planting peas and spinach and arugula and kale and so on, first, um, first planting. And we're doing this all on organic school properties and children will be able to eat that food and learn about good nutrition. So thanks.